Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in our class about sharing our ancestors' stories. Now, I did do a part one um, a couple weeks ago of this subject and found there is so much information that I just decided I can do a part two and I probably um, can do a part three and four. But anyways, as we're thinking about our ancestors' stories, we are going to focus on ways that we can take maybe a story that is written somewhere or maybe a piece of memorabilia that has a story behind it or maybe a picture or a recording, so many different things. We're gonna talk about how we can transform these either small subject matters or small objects into stories that will be interesting and help us and the rest of our family members to become closer to our ancestors. So we're going to start out by talking about the value of creating meaningful stories. I found this so interesting, and we did talk about this in the last class. I am going to just quickly review a few things, but most, most of the things that we'll talk about today are different. So why do we want to have stories about our ancestors and create meaningful stories? Well, this is a very interesting article. It was written in theguardian.com and it's entitled Why Children Need to Know Their Family History by the family therapist, Stefan Walters. And everything is very well backed up with studies and documentation. And I just find it very, very validating as a family historian. So here are some of the things that they're talking mostly about children, but we can talk about ourselves here and I'll share a, a reason why soon. So here are four things. These are just four out of the whole article. There are a lot more benefits of knowing the stories in our family history. First is emotional health. Children who have a strong family narrative enjoy better emotional health meaning they know the stories in their family. They are familiar with their ancestors. They have self-control. The more children know about their family, the stronger their sense of control over their lives and the higher their self-esteem. Again, I can apply this to myself as you can apply it to yourself as well. As we learn more about our ancestors, it gives us a higher self-esteem and a higher ability to deal with things. History, hearing stories gives children and adults a sense of their history and a strong intergenerational self. And then strength. I love the idea that we are stronger as part of a tapestry. And we all know that if you take one thread, you can break it. But when that thread is woven together, with many other threads into a tapestry, it becomes unbreakable, virtually unbreakable by hand. And so this is why stories are so important. And I would even put forth that stories bring healing. You know, we all have trials. We all have rough spots in our lives, or we know others in our family that do. And as we as we dig into these stories and learn more about our ancestors, I am finding personally so much healing and so much gratitude for those that have come before me as ancestors. Okay. So as I just mentioned, learning our ancestor stories helps us understand our lives as well as our family, their trials and success lends us strength through difficulties and difficult times. So it is up to us. We here who are in this class are obviously the ones that are interested in stories, interested in our ancestors. So it's up to us to make sure that these ancestors are remembered. And how do we do that? We create meaningful and interesting narratives for future generations. 
Now I want to talk a little bit about interesting. I have got several little packets of family history, just stories that I have been given. And honestly, they're, they're kind of dry. I mean, everything they're just, I mean, I'm grateful that I have them, but I have thought a lot about making stories more interesting and accessible, especially to a younger generation, because as we do it, they are the ones who will be carrying the torch on. And so we have to get them excited and we have to make things lively and make things something that they are attracted to. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about, um, this is my grandfather. His name is Carl Earl Davis, and he was born in 1913 and he was born in the upper peninsula, the UP of Michigan. And he was a wonderful grandpa and always a little crazy, honestly, for some reason, my grandmother at the time <laughs> did not like my grandpa and I knew it. And there were just kind of family lores going about as I was a child about how crazy he was. And I remember riding in a van with him and him tearing around a corner and I'm rattling around in the back of the van. But I also felt such great love and I felt like he just really, really cherished me. So the reason I bring this up is because just this week I have been working on learning more about his story. His father left their family when he was at the age of 14 and he and his brothers were the ones who were responsible to make sure that they were provided for, make sure they had food, make sure that they could have a log fire going because they didn't have electricity up in the upper wilds of Michigan. They had a little log cabin. And so he worked hard from the age of 14. He only made it through the eighth grade because basically he was working from that time on. So I always wondered how this hardworking man could just kind of become a little bit crazy, I guess I would say, or wacky. I mean, he was just like a super, super unique individual. So this week I was looking at some things and I'm going to show you what I found later, but I just want to tell you something I learned about this. So after doing a little research, which I'm going to tell you about later, this right here is a picture of soldiers who entered in Luzon in the Philippines after the Bataan death march. My grandpa was one of the very first ones that had landed on this, um, on this path after all of the prisoners were taken by the Japanese. And so he, he was one of the first ones responsible for trying to go and find these men and get them back. So I read a little day to day kind of travel log of what this company did. And then this is the part that struck me. Here's what I read about my grandfather. It said when the war ended, it would still be months before the men of the sixth division returned home. During this time, most near exhaustion were fed and nursed back to health while being briefed and essentially deprogrammed. After 306 days of combat, the last 219 being continuous, all, including even the medics, had learned to kill automatically. The men of the 6th Division had to gradually get used to the idea of not killing. They had to get used to the idea of no longer living with the rifle as a constant companion. In the years to come, many would continue to experience the effects of the war, including bouts of malaria and flashbacks. The reason I share this and the reason I was so profoundly touched this week as I read this written by someone who was there in the same company as my grandfather. First of all, I just felt such 
sadness for him that he had to go through this. And these men are fighting, I mean, hand-to-hand combat and sometimes with knives and just, there are, you know, dead people everywhere. How in the world could anyone be expected to recover from that? And he did come back and he had a successful career. He was able to live a normal life. He did have bouts of malaria that kept coming back, but I guess it gave me a very deep and profound gratitude for how normal my grandpa really was and an understanding of maybe why he was a little different. So for me, learning this story and and doing this research truly brought healing and comfort and understanding and gratitude for my grandfather. That's why stories are so important. And honestly, I can say I never ever have been any th- been through anything of any magnitude of difficulty like my grandfather did. And if he can do that there in the jungles, and live through all of the terrible things he did, then I certainly can overcome my trials and do the best that I can. So when we talk about creating meaningful family stories, the first thing that we have to do, and again, the last class, I went through more detail. I had a few more steps. I was using a specific project that I had done for that, which was creating a children's book. And it had a lot of steps to it. We've kind of simplified this here just so that we can have a clear picture of just the general method of how to create a meaningful family story. And the first is to choose your inspiration and starting point. The second is to choose the medium to use to capture your story. Three, plan and perform research. Four, refine and polish And five, publish and share your story. So I'm going to show you some things that I have done. And I mean, the sky is the limit with ideas here. There are so many different things that you can do to prevent, present family stories. So first of all, we're going to talk about choosing a subject. And then I'm going to show you how I have taken some of these subjects and created a story out of them. And when I say story, I just, I I also mean anything that can represent or give a view into an ancestor's life. So here are some subject ideas that I have used in the past, and then I'll show you a few things that I've done. So financial records, I have actually got these records from my great grandfather. And they're so interesting. These are his agricultural records. And he's talking about Bessie, the cow, and he milked Bessie and how much milk Bessie gave. And it's just really fascinating. The second, we have personal histories and journals. We have handiwork and recipes. Now, as, as I'm talking about this also today, I had the idea that, wow, We're getting kind of close to Christmas. So for those who are looking for interesting gifts to give maybe for your family or things you want to create that are meaningful, a lot of these ideas can lead to that. And I'll show you what I mean. Okay. So then we have memorabilia. This is a little typewriter here on the memorabilia that my grandfather brought back from Germany. It was found in a bombed out office building. And it is a German typewriter and it is heavy. I mean, probably 50 pounds. So I like to think of him, you know, trucking along with that. We have school and work records, photographs, 20 questions. And I'm going to talk about that. Family Bibles, church records, letters, awards and programs, and landmarks and maps. Now, these are just a few. These are just 12 ideas. Again, like I said, the sky's the limit. There are so many things that you could use as a starting point. So after we choose a subject, we're going to choose a format and a recording method. And what I mean by that is 
okay, are you going to make an essay out of this? A short story, artwork, a children's book, a photo book? What are you going to make out of the starting point, out of your starting subject? And how are you going to do it? A Word document, maybe pencil and paper, maybe Google Slides, maybe Mod Podge, and you're making a collage or something like that. So again, that these these are just simple ideas that can be taken further and we can have so many things. So here are some examples of things I've done. I'm going to give the subject matter and then the result. And as we do this, let's think about why this is important. So here following are a few ways to share our ancestors' lives and stories with our families. And I've realized it's so important to keep their names and their lives in front of us and present them in our minds. So, and present in our minds. So for instance, why do we want to have our ancestors' stories or our ancestors' lives right there in front of us, or maybe on a wall, maybe at our bedside table, we want them there in presence so that their lives can help make a difference in our lives. So here's one thing that I have done, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. Again, I, my family is from Michigan. This is a different set of grandparents. And this grandfather also fought in World War II. The typewriter is his, but we have a map here of the state of Michigan and we have some pictures. So you can see my grandparents, they had 17 acres and they built a home and on their farm, they had a lot of animals and not just regular farm animals, but my grandfather was an animal whisperer. So you can see the little picture of the goose there with my grandfather. This is a goose whose mate died and the goose decided that my grandpa was its mate and it would follow my grandpa all over and wait for him every morning. And as you can imagine, my grandma was not a fan of the goose because the goose would chase after anybody that was not my grandpa or anyone that even tried to get close to him. There is a, one of the goats they had on their property. And my grandpa always had a red tractor that he loved to drive around. So I was thinking about this and how much this place meant to me growing up as a child and as an adult. So recently when my grandfather passed away, I thought, I am so sad that my grandchildren and my nieces and nephews, grandchildren are going to miss out on that magical place. And so I took all of these things and I have a friend who likes to paint and here is what she made for us. So she made this little painting and it's a very rough painting. As you can see, she took a bunch of things and kind of put them together but what I thought is I don't want this just to be something that you look, look at. I want it to be interactive. So one thing I did was I made a little find list, as you can see over here. So we've got a peacock and you have five dogs, you have goats, you have the goose. So just things that are quintessentially my grandfather. He's got a little shop out back. He's got his tractor there. He's got his little brown workshop back there on the left. And the interesting thing about that is that the family brought, bought this property and lived in that little tiny workshop until they had the house built. You could see his rowboat. There are lily pads. And so it's just one way to create a meaningful narrative. So my cousin's children love this. They love looking for the animals and their mom can explain along with showing pictures, real pictures of the place, all about grandma and grandpa's place, especially since it's no longer in our family. I look at this and it invokes so many memories and so many stories. And it's just a wonderful starting off place. So that is one example of something that we can do. Most of us have someone artistic 
in, in our family. It doesn't have to be fancy. As you can see, this really isn't fancy, but look how it has just truly brought this to life. So that's one example. Okay. So I'm going to show you a couple other examples of how we can create meaningful stories or meaningful narrative about our ancestors. So I'm going to give the subject matter of a family tree. This is just my tree, my fan chart from family search. And I've just done a screenshot of it. And we may look at that and think, okay, well, it's a family tree. What can we really make out of that? But I'll show you some things that I have done with a simple family tree. So we take that family tree and look at this. If I expand the tree to be five generations out, and this is something that I purchased on Amazon. It is just a blank family tree. My daughter, who happens to have you know, great hand lettering abilities, she did this for us. Now, this actually is one that was done for a client that I have that I, I have been helping her with her family history and created this chart for her specifically to have for her and her grandchildren to give away and to have as a Christmas gift. So they made copies of this for everyone in their family and just are so happy with it. Now, this did not cost a lot. I mean, I think the poster itself was $15. It cost time. My daughters and I colored it in and my daughter, Abby, did all of the penmanship. But look at what a treasure that is. And having that on the wall, can you see the little children are going to go up and say, oh, well, who is Daniel Hollowell? Or look at this man. He lived in the 1700s. And it gives an opportunity to talk about our ancestors. It makes them present. And, and there they are. So that is another example of how it can become a story, even though it's an object, because there are so many things that we can talk about just from having these names, these dates, and these places, and that visual representation of how a family is organized and formed. Now, we do have something like this at the BYU Family History Library. If you come in in person for a very reasonable fee, I think it's five to eight dollars, depending on the size that you choose, you can have your fan chart printed out up to, I think it's eight generations. And it is really a treasure to have and something that's that's very meaningful. And I have done that as well. So again, I'm going to take a family tree. And remember, our goal is to get our family members stories into an interesting narrative that may create discussion or memories may create our minds moving or our family's minds moving about these people. Here's something that I did. I found that to do with birthdays and it's so easy, but yet it is so amazing. Look at this. So this is something that I found and what it is, is the birth flower for each of my family members. So on the bottom is my daughter, Emma, and then we have Abby, the orange flower. John is the purple, Jaden, that's Abby's husband, is the, the light blue. And then I am the holly berries up at the top, Michelle, that's me. So I was just thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to take maybe your four grandparents and do something like this? for each grandparent and their families. Wouldn't that be so interesting? And you can talk about, okay, well, look at the holly berry. That is a December birthday. So, so I was born in December. Well, what year was she born and what did she do? Where did she live? So these are all jumping points where that we can actually create meaning and probably to really make this meaningful on the back of this picture, I would write down as much information as I had about each person, when they were born, where they lived, 
If it's people that are farther back on your tree, maybe where, what their occupation was when they died, maybe a little interesting tidbit about them, but wouldn't that be fun for children to be able to look at these flowers and that can turn them to their ancestors. So creating stories, again, these are creative ways. As I said, the sky is the limit. There are so many different things that we can do. Okay, so I'm still using a family tree here, and this time we're using names. Here's something really cute that I found that I did just for my immediate family. But again, we can do this for all of our grandparents' trees or as far back as we want. Um, this is actually name art. So just, this was a free little thing where just a name generator. I just put the names in of my family. I even put my dogs in there. You can see there is Maisie, Sunny, Chancho, Alfie, and Bugsy. Those are my dogs and my daughter's dogs because they're definitely counted as family with us. But look how cute that is. And again, just visually having the names on there. You can just look this up yourself, do name art, name generate, uh, family name art. There are all kinds of different things that you can do. Again, to make this a jumping point for a story, something that might be interesting would be to do a piece of name art and then maybe have a family tree next to it where somebody can look and find that name and find out more information where that person lived, when they were living, what they did, et cetera. So this is another way to create a meaningful experience or meaningful narrative and story. So this is something that I am currently working on. I am not quite finished with it, but I kind of wanted to show you what I've been doing. This is a little diary that my grandfather who died a couple of years ago at the age of 99 left. And it was the year of 1940. And he went for about six months, somewhere in June, it falls off. But I am pretty sure that things were getting kind of crazy around there. The war was stirring up. I'm sure that he, he was registered for the draft and who knows what was happening. But I, I love this little diary. Sometimes he will just write a little bit like here. He writes on January 19th, still very cold snow dads into work today. So, oh, drove, he drove dad into work today. Now, the funny thing about this is again, because it is in Michigan where it does snow a lot, it's cold a lot in the winter of his entries are got snowed in again. Well, car hit a snow bank and I had to have somebody dig me out. It's just, it's so interesting to me how something so seemingly insignificant is vastly interesting. So in this little book, he talks about that he and his friends went into Elkhart to the Orpheum theater to see such and such a movie, or they went ice skating and he talks about places and events and things. So here's what I've done as thus far. And I am sorry, it's a little blurry there. I've got to do a better job at figuring that out. But here he said that they went to a certain church. So I researched, I went online and I found that church. And so along with this entry where he talks about where they went to church, I have a picture of the church. And then he talks about a lake that is right near where they are. So I found a picture of that lake and then um, a little write-up about the lake. Uh, when it was formed and, and a little bit about it over here on the other side, you can see, we've got the movies. He, they saw a lot of movies. Let me tell you, he went to the movies a lot and I can imagine why it's a good indoor activity in the middle of winter in Michigan. So here are two of the movies he saw. I went and found the movie posters. So along with his diary, I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting just to have a little bit more background about where he went and what he did. So down here, he went over to a little hamburger joint that I looked it up and I found this little ad there and the hamburgers were 25 cents. And so they got a hamburger and a Coke for 25 cents. This is a really fun project because as I'm doing it, 
first of all, I can just see that my grandfather is just a regular teenager, but also so sweet. He has some lovely entries in here about, he wrote a little poem for his mother on Mother's Day. And it's just really, really sweet. One time his mother actually writes in the journal how he's such a good boy and she loves him. And this is such a treasure. And so this is one example of something that that you can do. So my plan is to finish up the, the diary, make a little booklet out of it, and uh, to share that with my family. But again, look at the stories that this can generate. Also, maybe people will say, oh, I've heard of that lake. Let's go visit that lake. I have a lot of family in the area. Or, oh, let's let's watch those movies. We can find anything today, can't we? Let's see the movie that grandpa watched. Just so many things here that just gives a richness of his life. And I love that it is the little common things that he said. Really nothing earth shattering, nothing profound, but but yet look at what it creates and helps me to understand about my grandfather's life. Okay. So this is kind of taking us back to the beginning where I first started talking about my grandfather, Carl, and how he fought in the jungles. He was in the Philippines and in Papua New Guinea. And a, a couple interesting things that I have been given is you can see here, I've taken a picture of the medals and the pins that my grandfather was given. And really, no one knew anything about what he did, where he was. It, it just, I mean, vaguely a little bit. But as I did a little bit of research, I could go online and taking these objects, I was able to find out what each patchment, what the bronze medal is, uh, what his infantry pin is, what each of the each of the little ribbon pins mean. So, it was really interesting that I thought at first, well, why do I want to keep those? And then as I looked up, you can actually figure out what each one means. I found the map here of where his whole company fought and, and what they did. I found this article over here and Sidna, Michigan, that's upper, upper Michigan in the middle of nowhere. But I love this because it talks about how he got his bronze star medal and he also got a purple heart. And one thing that he did was a man next to him had a phosphorus grenade on his belt and a bullet ignited that. And he just turned right over and stripped the clothing from the, the fellow soldier to try to save his life. And he had burns on his hands that bothered him the rest of his life. So just with a little bit of research, look where these objects took me to. I mean, I really thought, wow, I, there's no way I'm going to figure this out. So this is the subject. This, this is what we have. And then it is something that I'm currently working on. But as I shared earlier, this is the same slide. Look what I found. I found what conditions were like, his day-to-day -day movements. I, I found um, what it was like for him at the end of the war. So there are, there's so much, so much that, that I learned from that. Okay. So I am just going to tell you about this. This is a great place, a jumping point for stories. This is called the 20 questions. And these are questions that are starting points for all kinds of family stories. So this Robin Divish and Marshall Duke at Emory University created these questions to help as a starting point for sharing family stories. And as we discussed earlier, Family stories are something that are so beneficial, especially for children, but also for us as adults. But look at these simple questions. Do you know how your parents met? 
Do you know where your mother grew up? Do you know where your father grew up? Now, I would I would say you probably could make a, a story out of each question. So for instance, do you know how your parents met? Well, where were they? Where did they live? What was what was the event that led to it? What was their dating like? What was their wedding like? So it's just a jumping point. We can do so many things from these one questions. So if you just go to psychologytoday.com or just look up 20 questions, family history, you will be able to find this. I just listed one through 10, but I thought, wow, that would make a really interesting uh, little booklet or maybe a chapter book about ancestors, but also it, each of these questions, you can tell that they really do something to establish roots for children. So I think that at this point, I think even, even where I am now, I am going to take these 20 questions and ask my children who are 23 and 25, and I am going to see if they can answer these questions. So how fun as even as a family holiday activity, answer the 20 questions. So it would be fun even to have them printed out and maybe have everybody fill them out as to what they think the answers are and then to, to share them together and discuss them as a family. So these are the 20 questions which are suggested. And again, this is just one through 10. Okay. And this, so this is what in my last class, I really focused on it and I'm just going to go through a little bit of it right here, but the subject that I have here, this, this is something again, that I created for, for a client that I have. I read this little story on family search on a family search memories that was attached to her uncle. And I just thought, oh, that is such a sweet story. So I am just going to quickly read this because it's only, only a, you know, paragraph and a half. And then I'm going to tell you what I did with that. So this story was told by Don Dyer to his grandchild. The grandchild transcribed it and then put it up on family search. So he was probably maybe using those, one of the 20 questions and talking to his grandpa about his life. And this is what Don said. As a teenager, I was finally allowed to ride my used bike and go to town with the older boys, a four mile trip to go to the movie. One night as we were coming home, it was very dark. We didn't have lights on our bikes. And as we started down the hill to cross Big Creek, the scariest place at night, of course, I was behind the others when my chain came off and there I was by myself and scared. Who knows what was there in the dark anyway? My older brother, Gene, came back and rescued me by putting the chain back on and staying with me down and back up that long, awful hill where you continually looked over your shoulder to see what was going to get you. It was not easy for the older boys to pedal up that long hill without stopping and for, and for a few years for me, but I don't think I stopped that night. Thanks, Gene. Okay, so there are several things that I really liked about this. I I just love the idea of being rescued by an older brother and how that must have felt. And obviously he said that he he doesn't even think he told his brother how much he really appreciates it. So I wanted to do this story. I wanted to bring this story to life for, especially for my client's grandchildren and children and even her a little bit. She didn't have a lot of family history done at all. And so she was very excited that, that I had found this little, this little story. So I'll show you what I decided to do. First, I decided, okay, I have to research this a little bit. So I am going to do the who, what, where, why, and when. Who it was, this was the Dyer family. 
and they were farmers and they had lived in the same area. They were in Oklahoma and they had six children. And this was the youngest of the six children. And this was a lesson that he learned about the strength of family ties. And so I like the idea of always having a moral of the story. So why are we telling family stories? We are telling them to gain something from them, to gain strength, to gain insight, to gain compassion. And so we always want to have a moral of the story. This was in the 1940s in Bakchito, Bryan County, Oklahoma. We have the Dyer Family Farm as a setting. We have Big Creek. We have Hollywood Movie Theater. And so I was able to take that small story and research every little bit of it and figure out where they were. I found land maps of where the farm was located. I contacted the historical society there and found out that there was one theater that would have been four miles away, which was the Hollywood movie theater. And then we have our why again, to help the reader get to know the family place time period of the Dyers. And again, learn the moral of the story. So I set out to this little tiny story and I researched it. So here are some things I thought about. And it was really interesting as I asked the family some of these questions, kind of like the 20 questions. For instance, as a teenager, you know, I thought about how how does a teenager feel? When was he a teenager? Well, we know in the 40s. He said, I was finally allowed to ride my used bike. And that told me a couple things. He had a used bike. So they probably did not have a lot of money. They were able to get him only a used bike. And so I thought, well, what kind of used bike is a kid going to have in the 40s? And so I, I researched that. I also gleaned from this that his parents cared for him. You know, they did not want him just going out at a young age, riding his bike four miles. And I thought that kind of shows a few things that his family, that they had not allowed him to do by himself, but also that they trusted his brothers and they went to town. Where do you live? He was in a rural area and I figured out what town that would have been and where he would have gone to the movies uh, with the older boys. So who were his brothers? How much older were they? And I found out the oldest one was about eight years older than he was. So there was quite a big, a, quite a big difference. And then a four mile trip to the movie. Again, I found the movie theater. One thing leads to another. And I just found a ton of things. A couple other things that um, he talked about is the big Creek. And so I found information about that as well. So I'm going to show you here what I published, what, what that little story uh, became. And just to let you all know, no matter what it is, it can be simple. Some of these ideas are so simple, you know, just print off a family tree. You can even do that on family search and ancestry. You can print off a family tree, either a fan chart or a portrait view of your family tree and share that with your family. It doesn't have to be anything big expensive. Really, none of these things are really expensive um, or crazy. This book did take quite a bit of time. I'm excited to do some more of them because now I have I feel like the learning curve is gone, but it was amazing when I gave it to her. So we, I printed these books up and I found a place that prints them for like $10 each. She ordered 50 of them to give to her family, but she called me after she got it and she said, Michelle, I am not a crier, but I've been crying since I opened the pages of this book. This is my family are captured so well. So that was very, very satisfying. And that was, that was what, that's what we want to do with stories. We want to connect generations. And so you are going to want to publish print and distribute copies. So whether it's like your own home printer or whether you write out 10 copies yourself and um, share those with people, 
If that's how you do it, then you can do that. And then you can share by email, calling, text, or through snail mail, et cetera. Now, I always... I always recommend publishing on family search and ancestry in the memories and the photo sections, because then we know they'll be there. We know that a lot of people will be able to enjoy what has been created. So here's a little picture of me holding the book after I finished it. And I showed her what I had done and she was, she was thrilled with it. So I just wanted to show you really quickly how this little book turned out. So here they are in their little Oklahoma farm. Here's the bike that he would have had. And this, this was actually one of the Western movies that showed on the screen at that time. All of these little brothers had red or reddish hair. And so we wanted to be sure to incorporate that. I put a lot of animals in it. For instance, when he talks about the creek, I, to make it, I thought, I want this to be really interesting for the children. And so I, I went to the county site and found the extension for agriculture and found what animal life lived near that creek. What would have been there? What would they, what would he have seen? And so I put a bunch of animals in it for the kids so just also to let you know, I made sure to make a bibliography to put where I got all of my information from. So here is the bibliography. And then just to end things up, I, I just have thought about this so much. You know, if we are here, we're here in this class, we obviously have an interest let's create stories and get them out there and share them. If we don't, who knows what's going to happen before the next person that's interested comes along and who knows how much information will be lost. If there is no one to remember or no evidence of a life accessible in this earthly world, a person ceases to exist for those who come after. So we have got to take a hold of all of those people that we knew and that maybe our close ancestors knew that we might have information about. We have to bring them to life and keep them present so that their lives are not in vain, but that we can benefit from the things that they learned and from their bravery and from the way that they live their lives. Okay, well, this is the end of my presentation. Michelle, there's one question. Yes. How did you get your book illustrated? Did you do that? Oh, I did some of it. I did some of it. Um, and then I have a niece that helps me. And she is the one that also did the painting of my grandfather's farm. But my daughters and I did a lot of it too.